now, this very minute, this very minute, watch me carefully. Opening to a clean page, she carefully wrote the child's name on the first line. P-R-U-D-E-N-C-E. -E. Now see if you can copy that. The small hand trembled so that the first eager stroke sent a great blot of ink sprawling across the page. Prudence raised stricken eyes. Oh, Kit, I've spoiled your lovely book. Tis no matter. You should see the great blots I used to make. Now, very carefully. Finally, it was completely written. Prudence, in quite respectable letters, without a single blot. Prudence was awestruck at her own handiwork. Hannah came to peer closely and admire. Let me do it again, pleaded the child. This time I won't make the R so wiggly. She grasped the quill in tense, careful fingers, and her lips silently formed each letter as she traced the lines. Over her bent head, Kit and Hannah exchanged an affectionate smile. For a time, they both sat listening to the small sounds in the house, the scratching of the pens, the rustling and snapping of the fire, and the slow purr of the yellow cat. How peaceful it is, thought Kit, lazily stretching her toes nearer to the blaze. Why is it that even the fire in Hannah's hearth seems to have a special glow? like the sunshine on the day that I sat on the new thatch with Nate. If only right now on that bench across the hearth, but what ridiculous daydream is this? Kit shook herself upright. Okay, so there's some repetition here, which is a literary device. Um, in the last two paragraphs, Kit mentions in her thoughts, she's noticing the fire and she's uh, she mentions fire one, two, three times. Fire, 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 blaze, fire. She also mentions the yellow of the cat and the sunshine. And I feel like all of these images are connected. Um, for one thing, when I think of the sunshine, I think of yellow. And when I think of um, a blaze or a fire, I also think of the sunshine. Um... And I also think of hints of yellow in there, too. So, I think that this could be another notice and note signpost for again and again. And it could also be a literary device of, of repetition. It could also be a symbol. So, we have a few things right here that could go into three different roles, three different categories. So, what is Spear trying to tell us by using these symbols, the colors and the fire, what is she doing by using the repetition of the images? And what kind of question can we formulate for the notice and note signpost of again and again? Tis too dark to work anymore, she said. Prudence laid down the quill with a long sigh and plopping down on the hearth, dragged the limp, drowsy cat into her arms. I wish I could live here with you and the cat, she said wistfully, laying her thin cheek against the soft golden fur. I wish thee could too, child, said Hannah gently. Remember Nate, remember Nate said it was like the psalm I was reading that day, the child said dreamily. Peace be within thy walls. Well, Kit interrupted too briskly, there won't be any peace anywhere if we don't get home in a hurry. She flung open the cottage door and a bit of milkweed, whisked in on a rush of November wind, spilling shreds of spidery white down. Prudence ran back to fling her arms about Hannah. Kit would remember many times the picture she carried with her along the darkening road. Was there some premonition, she would wonder, that made that moment so poignant, some foreknowledge that this was the last afternoon the three would ever spend together in the small cottage? She would remember, too, that all the way home she tried without success to find the answer that Hannah had promised could always be found in her own heart. I underlined in that paragraph that question that Kit asks herself, and it's a notice and note signpost for tough questions. And I believe that this question is important. Um, I believe that it also gives us an example of foreshadowing. What is being foreshadowed? What is Spear trying to tell us might happen later? She says, was there some premonition? Meaning, could she see into the future? Premonition means to see into the future. 
She had wondered what made that moment so poignant. And poignant means important, significant, monumental. Some foreknowledge, knowledge for the future, that this was the last afternoon the three of them would ever spend together in that small cottage. So here, right here, Spirit is telling us this is the last moment that Kip's going to get to spend with the three of them in this cottage. What is going to happen that she's not going to be able to do that again? Rachel greeted her reproachfully. You're very late, Kit. It was wrong of you to stay away from lecture. Your uncle was very displeased. And John Holbrook walked back with us to say goodbye to you and Mercy. Goodbye? Where is John going? Rachel looked across the room at Judith, who was setting who was setting the table near the fire. But Judith, her eyes, red from weeping, said nothing. What has happened, Aunt Rachel? asked Kit, bewildered. John has enlisted in the militia. There's a detachment going out from Hartford to aid some of the towns north of Hadley in Massachusetts against the Indian attacks, and John volunteered to go with them. To fight? Kit was too astonished to be tactful. Why, John is the last person I'd think to be a soldier. To the doctor they needed, and John has learned a good deal of medicine this year. But why now, right in the middle of his studies? I think it was his way of breaking with Dr. Bulkley, explained Rachel. He has tried so hard, poor boy, to reconcile Gershom's ideas with his own bringing up. Now, it seems, the doctor is going to publish a treatise in favor of Governor Andros and the new government, and John just couldn't stomach it any longer. We all think it is to his credit. I don't, spoke up Judith. I think it is nothing but stubbornness. That's not fair, Judith, Mercy spoke from the hearth. She looked a little more pale and tired than usual. I think you should be proud of him. Well, I'm not, answered Judith. What difference does it make what Dr. Bulkley writes? Now John won't get a church of his own, and he can never get married or build a house. Her tears broke out afresh. He'll come back, Rachel reminded her. The trip was only to be for a few weeks. He'll be gone for Christmas. If he cared anything anything about me, he wouldn't have gone at all. For shame, Judith, said her mother. You had better dry those tears before your father comes in. Mercy spoke thoughtfully. Try to understand, Judith, she said slowly. Sometimes it isn't that a man doesn't care. Sometimes he has to prove something to himself. I don't think John wanted to go away. I think somehow he had to. Judith had shut her mind to any consolation. I don't know what you're talking about, she snapped. All I know is we were perfectly happy, and now he has spoiled everything. I have another notice in next time post for words of the wiser, because I feel like Mercy, while she may not be older, she is definitely very wise. She seems to be um, definitely wiser than Judith. And when she says that um, sometimes it isn't that a man doesn't care in that last, that second to last paragraph, she says that sometimes it isn't that he doesn't care. Sometimes he has to prove something to himself. I don't think John wanted to go away. I think somehow he had to. So I wonder what does Mercy mean that he has to prove something to himself? What does John need to prove to himself? 